Hello friends. Welcome to the Eastern Front channel. Today we will talk with you about Friedrich Paulus, the German military commander and commander of the 6th Army, surrounded and surrendered at Stalingrad, one of the authors of the Barbarossa Plan. Whenever Luftwaffe planes flew over the heads of German soldiers, they looked after them for a long time and longingly, until they turned into a dot and completely disappeared from sight. One sergeant rode home with a heavy heart, looking at the planes flying by, how nice it would be to be on board one of them. After the Russians captured the airfield in Gunrak, only a handful of planes managed to land on the runway in Stalingrad, the air bridge collapsed, cutting off the last escape route for those who remained in the cauldron. The supply of the 6th Army was now entirely carried out by means of containers dropped by parachute. Desperate German soldiers dared to crawl out to no man's land. Just to get the cargo, they need so much. But Soviet snipers easily dealt with them and soon such attempts were stopped, in Stalingrad itself, the Germans ambushed Russian soldiers in the hope of getting at least some bread. The head of the medical service of the 6th Army, General Otto Rinaldi, was one of the first to surrender to the enemy, it was from him that Soviet intelligence officers learned that the commander of the 6th Army, Friedrich Paulus, was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. On January 24, Friedrich Paulus radioed a message to the Führer's headquarters, on the southern, northern and western fronts, decline of discipline and morale are noted. Unified command of troops is impossible, the most basic medical care is not provided to 18,000 wounded, the front is torn apart, further defense is meaningless, a catastrophe is inevitable. In order to save the remaining survivors, I ask you to immediately give permission to surrender, Paulus. On January 26, units of the 21st Army joined forces in the area of the village of Krasny Oktyabr and on Mamayev Kurgan with units of the 62nd Army advancing from Stalingrad. It was an exciting moment, especially for Chukov's 62nd Army, which had to fight alone for almost five months since the beginning of the battle for Stalingrad, there were tears of joy in the eyes of the soldiers, the general recalls, there was a truly festive atmosphere. Finally, the Stalingrad cauldron was split in two, and even so that Paulus and almost all the top ranks of the 6th Army ended up in the southern, smaller half of it, the northern group of troops of the 6th Army under the command of Infantry General Strecker continued senseless bloody resistance. An order was transmitted from Hitler's headquarters to this group to fight to the last bullet, to die, but not to surrender. The Corps could only communicate with the outside world through a radio station of the 24th Tank Division. On 30 January, Goering made a speech on the radio addressed to the German people. In his speech, he compared the soldiers of the 6th Army with 300 Spartans who stopped the Persian army, he also cited other historical examples, through which he hinted that a heroic death is better than a shameful betrayal. In Stalingrad, the same speech was perceived as a deadly insult. The wounded lying in the basement of the Stalingrad theater immediately recognized the general's voice. Turn it on louder, shouted one, shutting his throat, others insisted, accompanied his demand with very unflattering statements to the Minister of Aviation Goering. The next day, Hitler awarded the rank of Field Marshal to four generals, including Paulus. Perhaps in this way he was trying to neutralize the feeling of impending catastrophe, but Paulus regarded this gesture as an invitation to suicide. According to one of the generals, Paulus said literally the following, he thinks I'm going to put a bullet in my head, but I'm not going to do him that favor. Early in the morning, on the 31st of January, General Shumilov's 64th Army captured the center of Stalingrad. Basements were pelted with grenades and fired from flamethrowers, Red Square was subjected to intense mortar and artillery fire, the surviving grenadiers of Rosk, defending the first floor of the department store, the basement of which served as Paulus headquarters. In the end, the Germans laid down their weapons at half past seven in the morning. From the memoirs of adjutant Paulus Adam Wilhelm. January 31, 1943, 7 a.m. slowly, a dim dawn came, Paulus was still asleep, there was a knock on the door, Paulus woke up and the chief of staff entered the room. He handed the colonel general a piece of paper and said, congratulations on your promotion, you are now a field marshal, this is the last radio message, it came early in the morning. It must be an invitation to suicide, but I will not give them this pleasure, Paulus said after reading the paper. Schmidt continued, I have to report that the Russians came, saying this, Schmidt took a step back and opened the door. A Soviet general came in with an interpreter and declared us prisoners of war, I put our pistols on the table in front of him. Prepare to leave, the Soviet general said, 
I will pick you up from here at about 9 o'clock, you will go in your car, then the general and the interpreter left the room. It was good that I still had a seal, I fulfilled my last official duty by writing in Paula's soldier's book that he was now a field marshal general, and put a seal, which I immediately threw into the burning furnace. Then I went to Rosk, I wanted to know about the events that took place at night, he told me the following. A few hours ago, Schmidt ordered an interpreter to go with a white flag to the commander of a Soviet tank. After you left, I went upstairs with the interpreter. A Soviet tank was standing in front of the entrance to the courtyard, meanwhile it moved even closer. The entrance hatch was open, and a young officer was looking out of it, our interpreter waved a white flag and approached the tank, I heard that he spoke to a Russian. After that, he told me that he had told the Soviet officer the following, ceasefire. I have an extremely important matter for you, promotion and the order are guaranteed to you. You can come with me and capture the commander and the entire staff of the 6th Army. The Soviet officer contacted his commander before the radio. Two more Russian officers and several soldiers appeared, they came to the entrance to the courtyard where I met them. We went into the basement through a side entrance, which was next to Schmidt's room. Until now, it was covered with sandbags, but Schmidt ordered it to be opened. The negotiations were conducted at my place, and I offered to involve the commander in them. But Schmidt rejected it, obviously, he wanted to document for the last time that everything in the army was done according to his will. The chief of staff instructed me to negotiate, he himself intended to intervene only when, from his point of view, it would be necessary, meanwhile, a Soviet general arrived with several officers. After a formal greeting, he informed me of the terms of surrender, at the same time, he did not answer any questions or ideas from my side. When I was about to agree, Schmidt, who had been staying away until now, intervened in the conversation. He wanted to find out a few unclear questions, you, Adam, would be as stunned as I am to hear what Schmidt asked. He asked the Russians the following questions, firstly, can the field marshal keep a personal orderly, secondly, can he take with him the food belonging to him, thirdly, is it possible to assign an accompanying Red Army team to the field marshal for his personal protection during his journey to captivity? Frankly, I was ashamed, in recent weeks, I have often seen Paulus and talked with him, I can't imagine him giving Schmidt that kind of assignment. I have always been with him in the last few days, I remarked, and I know his thoughts. I also think that this is out of the question, if he was interested in this kind of thing at all, he would have told me about it, not the chief of staff. What did Schmidt want to achieve with these demands? Is he afraid of our own soldiers? After all, something about his stubborn behavior leaked to the troops. It seems that his conscience is unclean, how did the Soviet general react to these questions? I had the impression that he was just as impressed by them as I was, instead of answering, he asked where exactly Paulus was. To this Schmidt replied, smiling, the field marshal does not want to be involved in negotiations, he wants to be treated as a private person. It was obvious nonsense such a formulation contradicted the demands just made against Paulus. I think this is baseness on the part of Schmidt, with which he may have wanted to achieve advantages for himself. Paulus never authorized Schmidt to seek special privileges for him. At 5 and 45 in the morning, the last radio message was transmitted, Russians are at the door, we are destroying everything, a few minutes later, the radio station was smashed. Deeply dejected, I returned to my basement, on the way, I decided not to say anything to Paulus, I wanted to save him from unnecessary worries, he was sitting at the table completely blankly. When the moment of departure came, he got up and said, prepare everything for the departure of the headquarters, Adam, tell them to prepare two cars and one truck. The large entrance to the basement was closed and guarded by a Red Army sentry, the officer on duty allowed me and the driver to go into the yard where the cars were parked, startled, I stopped. Soviet and German soldiers, who had been shooting at each other a few hours ago, stood peacefully side by side in the courtyard, holding weapons in their hands or on a belt. But how stunningly different their appearance was. German soldiers skinned, in thin overcoats over dilapidated uniforms, skinny as skeletons, emaciated to death figures with sunken, unshaven faces. The soldiers of the Red Army are well fed, full of strength, in beautiful winter uniforms. The appearance of the soldiers of the Red Army seemed symbolic to me, it was the look of the winner. I was deeply moved by another circumstance, our soldiers were not beaten, much less shot, Soviet soldiers among the ruins of their city destroyed by the Germans. 
They pulled out of their pockets and offered German soldiers, who looks like half corpses, their piece of bread, cigarettes, and makorka. At exactly 9 o'clock, the chief of staff of the Soviet 64th Army arrived to pick up the commander of the defeated German 6th Army and his staff. At the same time, an official communique in Germany reported that there were no changes in Stalingrad and the spirit of its defenders was not broken. Well, and then, if you are interested, I can tell you about the fate of Friedrich Paulus, he had a terrible disease, rectal cancer, vigilant control was established for him, and he was provided with proper care. Paulus was secretly taken to the hospital, the German general was a pitiful sight, his emaciated sallow face was always gloomy, he was assigned a special diet, the field marshal ate reluctantly. Spring of 1943, Paulus met in a monastery in the city of Suzdal, the field marshal lived in a monastic cell, he was vigilantly guarded for the Soviet command, he was prisoner number one, and even then it was obvious that they wanted to play Paulus in a big political game. It is not known for certain at what point the decision to abandon Nazi ideas began to ripen in Paulus, but on August 8, 1944, Field Marshal Paulus made a difficult decision and spoke on the radio, which broadcast to the whole of Germany and called on the people of Germany to renounce Nazi Hitler, stop the war and thereby save their country, for which it is necessary to immediately stop the war. The Field Marshal was cured as best they could, and the cancer entered the remission stage, and from 1946, Paulus was settled in Tomolino, near Moscow, at Stalin's dacha, as a personal guest. The German was surrounded by care, attention and protection, had a personal medic, an adjutant and even a cook, but he was banned from entering Germany. In addition, it was not safe for the field marshal to be released for himself in Germany, the attitude towards him was mildly, say, unfriendly, and Paulus' death could seriously damage the reputation of the USSR. In 1947, Paulus was treated for two months in a sanatorium in the Crimea, but the field marshal was forbidden to visit his wife's grave and communicate with his children. Paulus was one of the most important witnesses for the prosecution at the Nuremberg trial, when Paulus entered the courtroom as a witness, Keitel and Goering were shocked. Paulus was one of those who took a direct part in the development of the Barbarossa plan. Paulus' outright betrayal could not be forgiven even by inhuman Nazi criminals, participation in the Nuremberg trials on the side of the Allies actually saved the field marshal from time behind bars. Most of the German generals, despite their cooperation during the war, were still sentenced to 25 years. Paulus, by the way, could not have reached the courtroom on the way to Germany, an attempt was made on him, but timely counterintelligence work helped to avoid the loss of such an important witness. On October 23, in 1953 after Stalin's death Paulus left Moscow. Before leaving, he made a statement I came to you as an enemy, but I'm leaving you as a friend. The field marshal settled in the Dresden suburb, because he was provided with a villa, security guards, and a car. Paulus was even allowed to carry weapons, according to the archives, the GDR Special Services, Friedrich Paulus led a closed lifestyle. His favorite pastime was to disassemble and clean service pistol. In the place of field marshal could not sit, he worked as the head of the military historical center in Dresden, as well as lectures and higher education of the People's Police of the GDR. Practicing benevolent treatment in an interview he criticized West Germany, praised the socialist system and used to say that Russia is no one to win. Since November 1956, Paulus has not left the house. Doctors diagnosed him with sclerosis of the brain, the field marshal paralyzed the left half of his body. On February 1, 1957, he died. When Paulus was captured, this was a serious bonus for the anti-Hitler coalition and for Stalin personally, Paulus was reforged and dubbed a traitor in his homeland, many in Germany still consider Paulus a traitor, which is quite natural. What was the fate of his comrades? In September 1948, adjutant Paulus Adam Wilhelm returned to Germany. He maintained warm friendly relations with him till Paulus' death. Arno von Lenski, he participated in the Battle of Stalingrad as the commander of the 24th Tank Division, with which he ended up in the cauldron in November 1942. He was captured along with other German generals on February 2, 1943. In May 1944, Lenski joined the National Committee Free Germany and the Union of German Officers, spoke on the radio, wrote articles in newspapers in which he openly opposed the Hitler regime and for a new democratic Germany. Attended the Central Anti-Fascist School in Krasnogorsk. Von Lenski returned to Germany in 1949. 
In 1952, the commander-in-chief of the Soviet occupation forces, Army General Vasily Chukov, suggested that Arno von Lenski continue his military career. Lenski accepted this unexpected offer and was enlisted in the barracks of the People's Police of the GDR. As a former commander of a tank division, he received the post of head of the Motorization Department. He was awarded the rank of Major General of Tank Forces. After his retirement in 1958-1962, von Lenski was a consultant to the East German equestrian team, because the former cavalryman really knew a lot about horses and made a good career in this field, Arno von Lenski died in 1986, having lived 93 years. But Walter von Sedlitz Kurzbach was unlucky, although among the generals captured in Stalingrad he stood out sharply with an anti-Hitler position, offered the Soviet leadership to form units from captured Germans to wage war on the side of the USSR, which earned him the unspoken nickname German Vlasov. But the Kremlin did not approve of this idea. Back in September 1943, Sedlitz was elected chairman of the Union of German Officers, which operated under Soviet control. Then he became deputy chairman of the National Committee Free Germany, actively participating in anti-fascist propaganda. Staying in Soviet prisons was not easy. Sedlitz was released in 1955, after a visit to the Soviet Union by German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer. Then almost all German serving sentences for war crimes were released from prison. Sedlitz decided to go to Germany, not to the GDR. And finally sent a letter of thanks to the chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR climate Voroshilov. Leaving the territory of the Soviet Union, I feel a deep need to express my heartfelt gratitude to the Supreme Soviet of the USSR for all the good things that I have experienced and learned here during my more than 12-year stay. Germany had a hard time for him, his colleagues considered him a traitor, they did not forgive his violent propaganda activities in captivity, so von Seydlitz became a stranger among his own old friends avoided him, he lived in seclusion, died in 1975. Arthur Schmidt While in Soviet captivity, Arthur Schmidt, unlike Paulus, refused to cooperate, despite all attempts by the NKVD to establish contact with him. He was specially transferred to Camp No. 48 in the village of Chernsey away from Paulus in order to protect the latter from his negative influence. After that, he was held in Lubyanka prison until 1955, when, together with other high-ranking German POW officers, he was released after the visit of German President Konrad Adenauer to Moscow. If you are interested, I will prepare a video based on the materials of adjutant Paulus about what happened in Stalingrad at the command headquarters. Write in the comments. Major General Moritz von Dreber, commander of the 297th Infantry Division, returned to Germany in 1949, and Colonel General Karl Strecker, commander of the 11th Army Corps, Lieutenant General Arthur Schmidt, Chief of Staff of the 6th Army, Major General Fritz Rosk, commander of the 71st Infantry Division only in 1955, as did Seydlitz. It is curious what the German generals would have said in August 1942 if they had known that they were waiting for a catastrophic defeat at Stalingrad, the humiliation of surrender and years of captivity? Would anyone believe that soon he would sincerely or forcibly become an anti-fascist, begin to denounce Hitler? Probably, they would have laughed in the face of the predictor. On the outskirts of Stalingrad, the German generals were self-confident, arrogant, but this arrogance was knocked off them. I am waiting for your discussions in the comments, and also do not forget to press the like button under this video, subscribe to the channel and click on the bell. And hope to see you soon. It was Tim and the Eastern Front Channel.